I don't think I'm alone in regarding Leonardo da Vinci as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, genius of all time. But why? Well, it's quite simple. It was his ability to achieve mastery, deep insights and innovation in an incredible, almost unbelievable variety of areas and fields. He is the ultimate polymath. The polymath is, in some sense, the extreme positive version of the ENTP archetype. It represents how their tendencies, such as constantly needing new things to engage with, being innovative and being ideational, can be used in the most powerful way, where they actually manage to succeed in a variety of areas, as opposed to being stretched too thin. Leonardo was a bastard. No, not like that. He was born out of wedlock, and at the time that had huge implications. One of which was that he wasn't able to gain a formal education, so he thought, I'll just do it myself. He didn't learn to speak Latin at a young age, although later in life he did learn a working knowledge of it, and Latin was the language that many important and influential books were written in. Also, because he was illegitimate, he didn't follow in his father's footsteps and go into the same profession as him, which at the time was kind of the tradition. Many of these things sound bad, and in many ways they were, but this also freed him up to explore, well, everything, to follow his curiosity wherever it led. It also liberated him from any of the prevailing dogmas of the time. He would often make fun of his own lack of education, but nonetheless described himself triumphantly as a disciple of experience. His approach to life was, in a word, scientific, in the most pure sense of that phrase. He'd make observations about the world, then try to explain them. Then he would rigorously test his theories and assumptions. Along with the polymath, the autodidact is something of an ENTP archetype in my mind, but not exclusively, of course. So I'm going to list out some of his achievements, ones that I think are interesting and can act as talking points, but these are nowhere near exhaustive. I encourage you to look him up, because it is absolutely mind-blowing. The amount of stuff he discovered, invented, or just understood. These wide-ranging interests are characteristic of the function of extroverted intuition, and in this case, that function in combination with introverted thinking. He seeks out new ideas, approaches, fields of study, ways of viewing the world, new techniques, and analyzes every one of them in immense detail, but also in a very detached way. He's not someone who's ever chained to his own frame of reference. And in case you're wondering how we know so much about him and his interests, it primarily comes from the huge amount of notes he left in his notebooks. And of course, he was a famous historian figure even at the time, so there are many stories to back this up as well. I'll put the text on the screen for this part because I know some people would rather read than listen. He studied anatomy. He initially studied the hearts of pigs and oxes, but later managed to get access to cadavers, which he would dissect, analyze, and draw. He's the first person we know of to discover the existence of coronary heart disease, hundreds of years before it was known, and using his knowledge of engineering, so fluids and weights and levers, figured out the mechanisms by which the four chambers of the heart functioned. Many of his insights in this area remain accurate and true today, containing knowledge that even still is not as widespread as you'd expect. ENTPs are often quite unintimidated by going into a new field, even when they're technically a novice. They know that they'll be able to pick up things quickly and blend ideas together faster than other people. He's the first person with a decent amount of accuracy to explain why the sky is blue. That's hardly one of his best insights, but there's something important about it. How many times have you heard children ask that question? And how many times do you hear adults asking it? So often, life can beat the curiosity that children have in abundance out of you. And there is such great wisdom in holding on to that. Interestingly, I think the notebook that has this insight about why the sky is blue is currently owned by Bill Gates. And I think that many of his notebooks are owned by the Queen, who's probably old enough to have been in school with him or something. He designed bridges, methods of diverting rivers, brutal war machines, mapped cities, he famously designed what is regarded as the precursor to a helicopter. Walter Isaacson, in his research for the biography he did, says that there was a surprising motivation behind many of these inventions. They were actually intended to be used in stage productions that he'd put on for people in the court of his patrons. He wanted the effect of angels falling, well, flying down from the rafters, hence him trying to create a flying machine. I thought this one was relevant to bring up because, so often, da Vinci seems to blur the lines between being a scientist and an artist. And I think that's because there isn't one. The mind of the artist and the scientist are one and the same. Both try to help us see the world 
more clearly. He has the most introverted thinking to-do lists ever, including things such as describe the tongue of a woodpecker and a crocodile's jaw, scheduling understanding, the acquisition of insight, and the pursuit of knowledge and wonder is something I think we could all do more of. In his notebooks, Da Vinci wrote backwards, so from right to left, in a way where his writings could only be read using a mirror. Many people have speculated that this might have been due to his desire to keep his insights secret, or at least difficult to plagiarise and steal. Another more obvious explanation is that it was simply because he was left-handed, although he was ambidextrous, and interestingly, dyslexic. So this was a simple logical decision to stop the ink from smudging on the page. Da Vinci was also gay, and at the time, there were potentially huge consequences such as prison, exile, or even death. Despite the consequences, this was surprisingly common during the Renaissance period in Florence. Experimentation. It is a great fault to repeat the same movements, faces, manners. Why people do so has often been a source of wonder to me. ENTPs value experimentation as an end in itself. But what does that mean? Well, in situations where you have a method you know will work, but you could also experiment and risk something going wrong, therefore losing time, the effort you put in, and potentially money as well, ENTPs are much more likely than most people to try the new and even riskier approach. One famous example was Da Vinci's famous Last Supper painting. Instead of using the traditional fresco technique for his paints, he opted for an experimental oil-based medium. The main advantage of this method was that it allowed more subtlety in the tones and colours. However, the experimental backfired, and since it was painted on a wall that was prone to damp, the painting started to fade and degrade very quickly. Luckily, one of his students created a copy of it, which is a surprisingly common thing to happen, and that one has lasted longer. Not finishing things. Whatever. The soup is getting cold. One of the obvious drawbacks of constantly starting new things is not finishing them. This is something that plagued Da Vinci throughout his whole life, and he was often criticised for it, especially by his great rival, Michelangelo. Da Vinci left countless projects, statues, monuments, art commissions, etc. unfinished. He would also revisit things over and over to redo them because he wasn't satisfied. His most famous work, the Mona Lisa, he carried around with him for 16 years, and still had it with him at the time of his death. That is one of, if not the main imbalance that ENTPs are going to face in their life. That excitement at the start of a project is going to be chipped away by the fact that there are many small roadblocks, setbacks, and annoyances that get in the way. Their top function of NE is a big ideas kind of function, whereas their bottom function of SI is more associated with small details. ENTPs get almost annoyed when they have to tolerate too many small details. They almost find it offensive that such glorious big ideas could be disrupted by seemingly inconsequential things. Despite the fact that he, like all the NTPs had a graveyard of unfinished things. That idea of revisiting work, even over many years, I think is a very useful one for ENTPs. Just because you get bored with it once doesn't mean you can't revisit it later. Also, he would rework things. There have been x-rays, or whatever the method is, of many of his paintings that discover many layers of paintings and drawings underneath them, where he painted over them just because he didn't like them. Once you're aware of the imbalance, it becomes a bit more manageable, because you don't have to beat yourself up about it or put pressure on yourself, but at the same time, there is a risk where you go, okay, well, I'm an ENTP, therefore I won't even try to finish things. Da Vinci did finish a lot of things, so don't let yourselves off the hook too much. Playing the game. So some of you might be thinking, okay, he's very impressive, but where does he get the time? I mean, after all, there are many people out there that would achieve lots of creative things in many different areas, but are simply overly burdened by obligations or are just trying to survive, let alone thrive. Well, he had patrons, very wealthy, powerful, and quite unpleasant ones. In order to satisfy his insatiable curiosity, he had to compromise. And I guess there's no other way to put it other than to compromise morally, in some sense. To ingratiate himself to the rulers of the time, who were essentially dictators, he basically go to them like an interview style and flex. He'd show them how he designed weapons of war that could help them win the inevitable upcoming battles. He'd show them he could create buildings, statues, and monuments, all in their honour, of course. He would also casually throw in, oh, also, I do some painting. Being a painter at the time was not really revered. It was one of the much lower class professions. The ability to mix with people of varying social class, political views, and in this case, people with varying positions on the moral spectrum, it's something that ENTPs seem to be excellent at. They're probably the type that's most likely to have friends in high and very low 
places. This is something that is characteristic of types who have blind spot, introverted feeling, so ENTPs and ESTPs. They can often struggle to know exactly how they feel about people, so are slow to make judgments on people often. It's important to note that Leonardo da Vinci did lament the fact that he had to be involved with people like the Borgias and the Sforzas, so he was definitely conflicted in this regard. So, for this series, I have basically an endless list of people, but if there's someone you'd like to see me talk about that you think is a good example of a type, then let me know down below in the comments. I get the sense that this is a video people will watch if they're already subscribed, but if you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe, and check out all of the links down in the description below. There are individual social media links, like an Instagram, a blog, also a Discord server, website, and Patreon.